Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long programme with one of my favourite people ever, Graham Norton. How are you? I'm very well, thanks for asking. Now, we've spoken before, but face-to-face it's been nearly ten years. That is incredible, isn't it? It's been an amazing ten years for you. Just reading your bio, and I read your autobiography a few years back, and seeing how, really, this is an accident, because you really wanted to be an actor, and you failed at it. Yeah, I mean, I, the big thing was I wanted to go to drama school, and, and I did, and studied for three years, and... I think when you get out and then it, it's not the kind of fabulous career you think it's going to be, I think that's kind of, that's the thing that drama school can't kind of um, uh, prepare you for. Because in drama school, you know, you're playing all the nice roles, you know, they, they, they train you to be the lead. When in fact, when you leave drama school, you're probably the butler, you're the neighbour, <laughs> the man in the garage. So it is a, it's a big anticlimax. Are you enjoying yourself because you're so busy and you're so wrapped up in being showbiz and this programme here and that programme there and rehearsing for this and doing that? Are you able to enjoy being the star that you are? I suppose you never really... I mean, that's never the bit you enjoy. The bit you enjoy is your job. And if having profile and stuff... You know, clearly, if I was 45-year-old, you know man who hadn't worked since he left drama school I'm not playing the lead in La Cage Fall in the West End so to that extent yes I enjoy my television profile and the things it brings uh, but actually why I do it is because the actual jobs I like the jobs I love hosting the chat show I like doing those big shows with Andrew Lloyd Webber and hopefully <laughs> I'm going to be enjoying uh, being back on stage being reviewed is part of your life as a comedian every night when you're stood on stage they're reviewing you whether they clap or laugh is determining your future on stage yeah. it's slightly different in the West End isn't it yes I mean I am sort of girding my loins for uh, for the reviewers uh, in that I think there's probably a the, what I think I would have to be incredibly good to get a good review. Uh, I, th- I think they will be coming in gunning for me. And look, well, one, they may be right, I may be rubbish, but two, I have to kind of just step back from that and hope that the show as a whole still works for an audience. Because it is a great show, and I think you've got, you'd have to be pretty miserable to leave the theatre in a bad mood after it. And, and, and also, it's not a one-man show. It, it's about all the rest of the cast, and there's an amazing group of guys called the Cajels who are just phenomenal. They should be in a zoo. They're not human beings. I mean, the, the dancing they do, they, they, you know, they're six foot something, and they can just do jump into splits, and it's incredible. So, you know, I, I won't destroy that. <laughs> And of course, then you're one of the few people who's allowed to be controversial on the TV. Are you nervous at this point that they're going to gun for you next? Because even over the Royal Variety, they were out to get you. You said something to Prince Charles. Are you nervous right now, or do you think you're going to be defended? I think certainly the the, the thing of the Royal Variety performance um, is an absolute thing of nothing. You know what I mean? That was re. I think. Wh- why that turned into a story is because the son uh, didn't understand um, <laughs> that when I was rehearsing, they thought I was kind of uh, taking the mickey in a rehearsal. Oh, he's being really rude. Da, 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 da. And in fact, I was just reading the script. <laughs> you know, that night, Prince Charles and Camilla sat there. I said it to them. It was just a, re- a really, mar- it was a quip off the back of uh, Pussycat Doll singing, Don't You Wish Your Girlfriend Was Hot Like Me, which is a funny thing that they came out and I got a Royal Variety performance. They came, they, that was the opening of the Royal Variety. They came out and sang that to Prince Charles and Camilla. Um, and so I just commented on it. Um, I think when you work at the, at the kind of the end of the spectrum of comedy that I do, um, or indeed Jonathan and Russell or all these you know other people who got in trouble, mistakes are going to be made. I think where the BBC need to be really confident and clear is that actually there are thousands of safeguards in place. Um, my chat show, although it might seem very kind of edgy and out there, that script's been seen by lawyers before we tape it. Two lawyers sit in the control box watching the recording and somebody else checks the edit. So I'm very protected and the public are very protected. And I think it's incredible, given the amount of output on the BBC. You know, they've got seven radio stations, uh, four TV stations, they've got the, the web. Um, I think that's a remarkable achievement that not more uh, offensive material gets out there. There's layers within layers. So I feel very protective because the thing is, you know, in the in the, the Jonathan Ross, Russell Brand thing, the people go, oh, what were they thinking? The point is they weren't thinking. They were in the zone and they were off on a kind of comedy riff and... It, I, both of them admit that it was a mistake it shouldn't have happened I think what went wrong was that there was no one there to protect Andrew Sachs no one there to protect uh, Jonathan and Russell that's where I think it fell down 
And then, of course, we look at you and your beginnings in TV. You were shocking and outrageous, and you still are on BBC Two, yet you're primetime BBC One on a Saturday night, and everybody loves you. You're almost unique in that way. I mean, there was Jim Davidson in the old days, wasn't there, who had his mucky live show and then did the Generation Game. What a clever thing that is, that you can be loved by two completely different sets of audiences. Well, see, I don't think that the audience for the shows are different. I just think they're like me. They're in a different mindset when they watch those shows. I mean, yeah, there's some that will never cross over. There's some that, you know, like musical theatre, like Andrew, and I'm just... I'm just along for the ride. And then there are people who watch The Chacha would never watch those shows. But I think audiences are kind of brighter than that. You know, they get it, that one show is a kind of a late night show and one is tea time. And the people who enjoy The chat Show and enjoy what I do there, I don't, wouldn't enjoy it if I tried to do that at seven o'clock on a Saturday night. It's just, it's about context. It's about, I think it's like all of us, you know, over Christmas, we'll go home and we'll spend time with our granny or whatever. And you're you're, you're still yourself, but there are just things you wouldn't say to your granny. Um, and, you, you know, when you're down the pub with your friends, you're a different person again. And none of it's a lie. None of it's not you. It's just you choosing how to behave in certain situations. And on the chat show on BBC Two, there are still moments, even this week, where you say stuff that makes you go, ooh, but how does he get away with that? When you're doing it yourself, are there moments when you're reading it thinking... Why am I saying these things about Camilla, whoever it may be? Yeah, there are bits in the monologue uh, where I kind of think, really? <laughs> really we're saying this? Um, and what? And although, it, I mean, a lot of those jokes, I think, are, you know, they're very, they're clearly they're very cruel jokes. But we try uh, to police ourselves and lay off people if we feel they're becoming a victim. So, like, Amy Winehouse was funny, 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 oh, not funny anymore Britney for a while wasn't funny now she's funny again um, you know, I, because I think kick a person when they're down and it's it's yeah it's, it's unpleasant but you know listen if Prince Charles and Camilla lose sleep over things that I say <laughs> really they, they need therapy and we look at what you've done in your career and where you're going now it seems like you're it I mean you're all that they've got left in terms of a personality how does that feel <laughs> I'm depressed on behalf of a nation <laughs> I don't think that's true I think there are lots of people out there you know you're not the first one to say things like that to me and it's like but I don't do that much I mean I, uh, I do the chat show and that's it where you know BBC One BBC Two Three Four they're on 24 hours a day um, I, you know I'm just lucky I suppose that my shows have profile but there's lots of other people and lots of other shows out there you say that but there are sideline jobs like Eurovision which have come up that make you stick out again and it seems like they had a lot of people to choose from there's 60 odd million people in the country and they chose you they didn't have to but let's talk about that gig and get that out of the way because everybody's want to hear about it are you nervous taking over from the Wogan uh, of course I am because the point is it's not really a job at all it's only a job because Terry Wogan's made Made it one. You know, 35 years ago when he went out to do the first one, presumably they just wanted him to kind of, you know, fill in a little when they were speaking French <laughs> or, you know, and he turned it into this institution. So I imagine that for my first outing in Moscow, I'll be quite quiet. You won't hear much from me. And if I get to do it again, maybe I'll I'll build my role. But it, I'll, I'm nervous, but also it is an honour in that, you know, Terry's kind of handing over the mantle and I'm sure a lot of people would have wanted that gig and it's the sort of gig you can't turn it down it's very hard following Terry it'd be nicer to, if someone else had done it and failed um, and then I could have done it uh, but I'm afraid someone else is going to get that privilege they can take it over after I've failed <laughs> and are you remotely bothered by the fact that the show is a farce? And look, it, it's always been a farce in that it's a singing competition. That's what it is. It's a song <laughs> contest. You know, it clearly isn't, you know, it. you can't take it very seriously. It's not, you're not saying who's done the best operation on a brain, <laughs> you know, who's developed the best drugs for something. It's a song contest. It's people wandering out singing songs. It's a lovely, happy thing. But it does appear that Terry's now taking it a bit seriously to walk away from it because politically it's a farce. That seems ironic in itself. Yeah, Terry last year did seem to get quite worked up by the voting. And I suppose it is frustrating uh, because he's seen it all over the years. You know, we're, we're sat in our armchairs. It's, it's harder to care. Maybe when I get to Moscow, I'll care deeply. And I will care deeply because, myself, you know, Andrew's writing the song this year and we're finding the person to send. So I, suppose I will have a bit of a vested interest in the, uh, in the uh, UK entry. And I think we might do better because it's good to have a big name like Andrew attached. You know, because that was one of the things Terry was saying, that if we send Take That or Elton John or Rod Stewart or somebody, we would do better. So I think having a, a you know a really well-known figure like Andrew writing the song, it tells your... It, sends a, it gives a good message that we are taking it more seriously. It's just come to me. Andrew Lloyd Webber writes it. Jane McDonald performs it. Now, you see, you're pleasing everyone there. 
That feeling when you go live, and there aren't many people can do that well for a start. That's why you're so good at what you do, because you make it look as if it's just you and me, when in fact there's a million people watching and there's a million people producing and in your ear and all of that stuff. How does that feel when you know the world is watching you, or at least Britain's watching you, when you go live? In those big Saturday night shows, I suppose I've been lucky because I should, you're quite right, but you should be absolutely terrified. But what's good is because I've got all these kids backstage who are going to come out and sing with a big live orchestra, they are so nervous. So actually any nerves I have are for them <laughs> because all I have to do is manage to walk down some stairs and read a bit um, and they have the tough job. So uh, in a way, it kind of takes the pressure off. So it's easy to relax. We see it all the time, though, don't we, when news people's auto cue goes down and then they can't carry on. When you do stand-up, that's your job, isn't it? Do you think that helped? I mean, it does help. I do feel sorry for news because it's much harder to ad-lib news. <laughs> <laughs> Other things I imagine might have happened today. <laughs> well, your monologue's an ad-lib of the news. <laughs> yes, yes, most it is. Um, so, uh, I, it probably does help. That, that I've got that back. Also, I'm sort of, you know, I'm confident that once there's an audience, there'll be something to do to fill the time. You can just chat to them or, or whatever. But it's all it, it's trusting the team as well because there's all those people backstage or behind the scenes who have put so many kind of things in place the structure if this happens this will happen if this goes wrong there's a, so there's always backup plans and you know all, all sorts of things when I started doing the big Saturday night shows uh, if you look closely you could occasionally see uh, a little <laughs> twitch in my eye and even now you know it, it's that bit at the end when someone's counting in your ear so you've, you know, you've got to stop you know casual to be on in a minute um <laughs> That that is qu that's still quite stressful. Kind of park. It's like parking the car with people watching. And I noticed in those Saturday night shows as well, they allow you to have the odd camp aside. How many of those are you allowed a series? Uh, we've never counted them. <laughs> uh, it's it's whatever. The, it, it's one of those things. It's when they're appropriate and when they're funny enough and when they're right. You couldn't do them all the time. I enjoyed the ones in the songs when you'd have a drum or something. They were nice. Well, yeah, they just uh, they were nothing to do with me. I, I had no interest in doing them, but they uh, they uh, they made me do them. I, I didn't want to. Let's move it back to your childhood now and talk about what you were like then. Were you funny? Were you entertaining? Were you boring? Were you annoying? Um, I don't know what I was. As a little child, I think I was... I Maybe I'd say I don't know, but then I went to school, and I think I just sort of sat it out. You know, it was one of the things I knew that I wasn't going to stay in Banton County Cork, population 5,000. You know, I'd seen television now. I knew there's a world out there. <laughs> so it was a kind of a waiting game. I just knew that I'd got to get through this, and then I could get out there. And I think... I. In terms of being a stand-up or being funny, I think that's really developed when I was working in restaurants, which I did for about eight or nine years, um, and just messing around with the other people who work there. Because it's a really, it's a bit like being a show, because it is a very intense experience. You know, if you're working in a busy restaurant, you really bond with those people. And it, I sort of, I've never laughed as hard since as I did uh, back in the restaurants. But... At the same time, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> I'm not, I didn't laugh so hard that I'd like to still be there. It was also miserable. When you're with the audience, that's where you're most at home, riffing off them and finding funny from nothing. I know you're not really a comedian, you make that very clear in your book, but you've got a funny bone, haven't you? That's one of those things, you know, you can't think about that too much or then, you know, funny bone be gone. <laughs> uh, but hopefully I do, and hopefully... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite a social person. I'm probably less funny in life now than I used to be. You know what I mean? If I went to the dinner party b before, I would probably be that funny guy we met at so-and-so's dinner party. And now I don't do that because that would be really annoying. It's just like, <laughs> Graham Norton, shut up. God, yeah, we get it. Yeah, yakety yak. So I tend to be kind of more reserved now, I suppose. And then we move on to you becoming a star. That wasn't easy, was it? It didn't come overnight. Uh, no, it really didn't. <laughs> um, you know, because it's like, you know, people, uh, you know, taxi drivers are always asking, you know, how did it happen? To, to, or, you know, their kid wants to get into presenting and what should they do? And I just, there's no advice to give people uh, in it's about persistence. I mean, it, hopefully it's about a certain level of aptitude, but really it's about persistence. And then it's about luck and it's about uh, sort of luck on luck, because getting the chance to host my own show was great. But if that had been a failure then I was further back than I had been before anyone gave me that opportunity. So it's all the way along. It's, it's really about sticking with it and just big wheelbarrow loads of luck. Now you're Graham Norton, and most people who come on your show know who you are. Does that ever become normal, especially with the Hollywood people or the American people? It is weird, particularly if it's somebody I don't expect to have seen the show. You know, they'll just go, oh, I love the show. Like Barry Manilow was on recently, and he... 
afterwards was talking. He, he's watched. I mean, he knew more of the show than I did. I mean, I think it's a problem. Uh, he watches hours of it. He's got it all on his, you know, his back catalog thing in his television at home, and he watches the episodes. And he knew it all. So that was a, you know, that's so weird that you kind of think Barry Manilow he'd be busy. He wouldn't be. He wouldn't be watching a chat show from Britain. I don't know what's more sad: the fact that he watches you, or I watched him watching you watching him. <laughs> I saw a whole other side to him. I didn't think he was funny for a start. Well, he was. He was very relaxed on the show. Yeah, and I think because he knew the show, and I had met him once. I met him in Vegas, and uh, so because of that, I think he just you know he knew he was safe. Because I think in the past he's had quite bad experiences on chat shows where people were taking the Mickey out of him and his music and his fans, and in the end. I sort of, I, you know, I have a huge admiration for Barry Mello. He has written, you know, the songs that make the whole world sing, apart from that one. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that show in Vegas as well, and I think, I don't know whether I've ever had a camper evening in a theatre, ever. It's quite an experience, isn't it? It's quite full on. <laughs> yeah, mind you, on, down the road, they've now got Bette Midler and Cher and Elton John. <laughs> so uh, that's maybe camper. We're back with Graham Norton here on your favourite local radio station, celebrating a remarkable performer and a remarkable life and career. And it shows no sign of stopping, because I think there was a point at Channel 4 where we thought, is that it for Graham? Did you worry? Yeah, that's why I left. In a, you know, I'd, I'd been there for, I don't know how many years, and I'd done the Five Nights a Week show for two years. Didn't want to keep working that hard. <laughs> um, so, but it, I, so going back to once a week at Channel 4 wasn't really an option. I, I needed something else. And that's where the BBC came in, because what's great about the BBC is that you can do a range of work because they have different outlets. So I could do the big family entertainment thing. I can do the chat show. Whereas I think of ITV, if I'd gone to ITV, I'd have had to choose which one I wanted to do. And I didn't really want to choose. Do you feel bad for a moment at what you're being paid by us? I don't feel bad, but equally, I would work for less. I should probably say that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I would do my job for less. How much less? Uh, we'll discuss that. That's what, what's my agent's <laughs> for. That's my agent's for. But the, you know, BBC slash fees, you know, I would, I get why. At my level, I'll still be paid well, if less. It would still, you know, it's uh, still a lot of money. Thank you very much. But... For people on the up, I, I worry that kind of all the rising stars would end up on Channel 4 and ITV. You had a moment when you went to America and was the big star over there, and the show was a big success over here. Did you enjoy that? Was that as much fun as over here? I enjoyed being, I love being in America. Working there is quite hard work, but also, I suppose, because of where we'd come from. So we'd come from, you know, we were kind of top of the heap of Channel 4. You know, we kind, you know, we didn't answer to anybody. We did whatever we wanted. To, and suddenly we were the new kids. And that was kind of like, oh, we don't, you know, it was not very pleasant particularly for my producers the people I'd worked with for years they suddenly had to suck it up when we got to America and have meetings with all these terrible executives so none of them were very happy I probably had a better time but living in New York would kill me because you, it's just, you know when they say the city that never sleeps I didn't know that was just like that was <laughs> true I thought it was an expression uh, so yeah I would die if I lived there do you get involved with the suits very much do you kind of let other people deal with the business side of the program and you just present it how involved in that are you um I suppose at the BBC, I'm involved a bit, but hope uh, the thing is, I'm only involved when it's nice. Uh, if they're taking us out for lunch or if they come to see the show, <laughs> that's all very nice. Uh, if we do something wrong or they're annoyed with us or they want us to change something, then I'm sort of protected from that. They've got to, they sort of sideline me and go directly to the suits who work with me. Suit talks onto suit. Because it is a different discipline. When you look at stand-up comedy, you basically can say what you want. Your name's on the tin and it's your show. You do what you want. Actors don't have the chance to say anything. And you're kind of in between the two, aren't you? Where you have some say, but you've still got producers and their producers and their producers' producers. Do you take any of that personally? Well, luckily, I'm working with people I respect and trust. So I, I'm happy for them to tell me because I, I want someone to tell me. Uh, when I do resent is if I'm working with someone uh, that I think's a bit rubbish and they're telling me and I'm thinking, no, you're wrong. But... I, but those are the, those are very odd instances. Those don't happen very often. And what's it like for you now being in your mid-30s and having 12-year-old producers and things like that? Does that bother you at all? Thank you for saying I'm in my 30s, <laughs> 45. Um, uh, actually, my producer is uh, not that young. <laughs> and also, it's kind of good that there are young people around because... Uh, like, particularly with guests and things, you know, we often try out a name of a guest. We go out, you know, to the researchers and stuff. Okay, if I said the name, you know, whatever, would it mean anything to you? So sometimes people we think is going to be a good guest, it's just blank faces all around. And equally, sometimes we get offered people and we're like, who? And the team are so excited because, you know, they're in some show that we don't watch. And has it ever become uncomfortable when you're now the big star, Graham Norton, with friends from the past who really need your help, but they're not big enough now to be on your show? Yeah, I mean, that is awkward. But at the same time, in the end, it's down to... The booking is down to kind of producers and a celebrity booking. I have a, a yay or nay on the names they suggest, 
but equally you know I I can't just kind of wheel in my friend who's kind of <laughs> doing a, a play at the tricycle and say would you would, can he be on and you know you feel bad but at the same time I think they understand because they see the, the level of guests we have and you need people to be doing a lot of clapping when they walk on um, I think it would just be yeah, bad for everyone, really. Very finally about you, what do you enjoy doing? Do you have much time to yourself? Because we see you on the telly a lot, but of course you tape stuff and then things go on for a while. Do you get to go away much now? The last couple of years I've been lucky. I get to go away for uh, two months in the summer and I go back to Ireland. And that's fantastic, which is weird. I never thought I'd want to go back to Ireland, uh, but it's, it's really lovely. I drive back, bring the dogs, they run around. It's all very good. And when I'm here... Same as everyone else, you know, I watch telly, walk the dogs, uh, <laughs> go out for dinner sometimes. Um, I'm at, but at, and also I have to just take care of myself now because I'm going to this musical in the West End, so you can't get sick. Like the other day, I, you know, if, if I was just doing the chat show, I wouldn't have thought I was sick at all because it, it didn't, you know, it didn't affect my performance there at all. But because I've got to sing, you can't, you can't even be a tiny bit ill. It's really, it is, a, you know, it's a big pressure. And physically as well, you write a lot in the book about weight, and of course that was your calling card in the beginning, that you struggled with it. Now you look delicious. Congratulations on that. How have you managed it? Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> it's boring. You know, it is. It's going to the gym a lot and run, um, you know, spending a lot of time on a running machine. Um, and, I, and I do that so that... And I still can't eat what I want, but I do drink what I want. Um, and it's... Yeah, it's, it is quite boring. It's just having to pay attention. And if I wasn't on television, I don't think I'd have bothered... I think I'd just be a big lump now. Um, but television is a really cruel mirror. Because, you know, if, you, if it's regular, if you're just leaving the house, you can look in the mirror and you can tuck your shirt in a certain way and look at yourself a certain angle. And in your head, that's how you look all day. All right. <laughs> but television, you'll suddenly see a shot from the back with a big lump of fat sticking out of a suit or something it's miserable yeah so it, I think that's why people on TV are slightly obsessed by it and would you ever consider surgery or anything like that for TV purposes only uh, not even for TV purposes yes I would uh, yeah I think next year I, I, I've been booked in a couple of times to have the bags done under my eyes and then I thought oh why bother and you know it, they don't look that bad da, 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 da. but um, because in uh, Le Cage Fall I've got to drag up um, putting on you know all this woman's makeup I kind of thought well when I put all that makeup on I'm sure I look gorgeous hideous absolutely <laughs> hideous so if I was a woman I'd have had plastic surgery about 10 years ago um, so <laughs> now I think when I come out of the casual fall the first stop will be the plastic surgeon's office where do they come from just lack of sleep or just a hard life they're kind of I've had them since I was a kid but you know but the older you get the more unforgiving things are <laughs> you know like you know your dentist always says you know things that are cute in in your teeth when you were a, when you're a kid as you get older it's just less forgiving um, so I think that's what is just it's age age and genetics anything else would you have anything sucked out or enlarged or shrunk maybe no that no I'm done I'm done well I say I'm done of course I think once you once you start then you can't stop but you know I, I I don't mind getting older, so you know I wouldn't bother with Botox, any of that. It's just I hate the bags of my eyes. Always have. So um, may well, I like I say I have I have been booked in a couple of times, but then didn't do it. So maybe this is the time I'll do it. Graham, are you going to be the next Joan Rivers? <laughs> um, I don't think so. But the trouble, what if it goes horribly wrong? Then you have to have something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you have to correct it. So it is scary. I mean, they're not hideous. They're not dangling like stalactites. I mean, couldn't you cream or something? Isn't there a certain cream that you can rub on I've heard about? Can you imagine the amount of cream, amount of, well, one, the amount of cream I'd need, <laughs> but also the amount of money I've spent on cream already. <laughs> if creams could do it, plastic surgeons wouldn't exist. <laughs> and very finally about this show, then let's get to the reason that you're here. Because let's face it, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't got something to plug, would you? <laughs> I'm here to sell, sell, sell. And do you think your audience will get it? I was thinking about this because I saw it last on Broadway. I haven't seen it yet in the UK. It's hard to explain. Help me with this. It is. Well, if people come expecting a kind of really shocking out there gay thing, it's not that. It's actually very family friendly and funny. It's a bit saucy. It's a bit cheeky. But really, you could bring your granny or your kids to it. It's you know, it's it's a it's a very kind of family friendly night out. Um, it is camp. It's very camp. So if you're coming expecting that, you will get that. It just I don't know. It's it's a heartwarming. It's funny. It's it's a really lovely show. Like I say, I saw it you know 25 years ago, and I've wanted to do it since then. And there's one bad thing about theatre. A, you've got to do eight times a week. And then there's a stage door. And the punters know that you have to go in there and you have to come out of there. How are you with that? I'm, I'm fine. You know what I mean? In that presumably 700 people won't be there every night. Uh, there'll be a couple. And that's, that's you know, fine. Because it's the winter. They're standing in the cold. Uh, <laughs> so the least you can do is sign a bit of paper. And do you like this? Or would you rather have the microphone and you be asking the question? I always feel sort of underwhelming as a guest. You always kind of think, oh, God, you know, <laughs> if only, if only I had done something more interesting or, you know what I mean? Um, so, 
yes, I probably wouldn't book me on my own show. <laughs> or I'd book me once and then kind of go, no, never again. And how have I done? I, I don't ask the questions you ask. You see, you're so well prepared and you've got all the clever questions and here's me just chit-chatting. Really. Oh, see, I think you've done very well because you haven't you haven't looked at a piece of paper once. You haven't gone, oh, hang on, what am I saying? Uh, or you haven't got things wrong. Whereas when I'm talking to people, I'm constantly kind of going, you know, <laughs> now, like Brendan Fraser. Now your father was a diplomat. Nearly. He, uh, he, worked, he worked for the Canadian Tourism Board. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's what I thought. Let's go shopping. Casual yeah. foes on at the theatre. Which one? It's on at the Playhouse Theatre on Northumberland Avenue. Congratulations on being you. You're totally unique. And when I saw you in that theatre probably 10 years ago, you just had a roaring sellout crowd from the minute you came on stage and completely original. And I think I've said to you since then, when are you going to come back to it? Because I'm sure people would love to see Graham Norton live doing comedy. And, and actually, you know what? Doing the, the Casual Foul has kind of made me think, ooh, I... You know, I'd enjoy this more than I remembered I'd enjoyed it. So maybe sooner than I thought. Because, you know, it's that thing, isn't it? It's just having to... It's just not being a lazy lump, you know? So it's just having to shift myself. So the fact that I'm going to work now makes me think that, oh, maybe I could do something else. And one other thing I've learned very finely is that live comedy audience, theatre audience, your live shows on TV audience, you're very needy, aren't you? You need the round of applause. I do. I'm a vortex of need. I'm like Liza Minnelli. <laughs> Craig Norton, thanks so much for talking to us. Cheers.